Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Hello and welcome. Thank you so kindly. Appreciate you coming out for our program tonight called The Trust Paradox, the future of privacy and transparency in the digital economy. With us to weigh in are Chris Kelly. Chris is a longtime policy and privacy strategist and also the former chief privacy officer at Facebook. We also have Jen King. Jen is director of privacy, the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford, and then Ruby Zeffo, chief privacy officer at Uber. And here to guide them in conversation is Paul Rorig, head of strategy from Cognizant Digital Business. We want to extend our special thanks to Cognizant for their help with this program, especially Kathy Abrena, Corey Olfert, Feather Hickox, and Paul Rorig. As always, it takes a group of knowledgeable people to put these programs together for you, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. For our new guests, I know we have people traveling uh, among the U.S. states as well as internationally who have joined us this evening. Churchill Club is the premier independent thought leadership forum in the Silicon Valley and greater Bay Area. We, our nonprofit mission is to strengthen innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. Uh, in our conversations, we look for opportunities to strengthen those things. Uh, we look at possible future states based on key trends we are seeing today, which is what we're going to hear tonight from our panel. We always ask our speakers not to pitch or promote, um, but rather to focus their comments on what's new, next, not widely known. Thank you very much for your attention, and let's now bring our speakers and Paul to the stage. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight we're going to uh, begin to not solve everything uh, that could be solved related to truth, trust, transparency, and privacy, but we're going to give it a go. Um, there is simply no bigger topic in any media channel right now. It's either the rise of national populism or what do we do about the new machine? the new internet machine that run on the internet that are creating more amounts of business value than the industrial economy of years ago. And it's changing how we're relating to companies, how companies create value, and perhaps even more importantly, how societies form. And, and in fact, putting a lot of stress on societies, which is why there's a huge amount of debate. Um, and we're going to crack into what is the future of trust? What is the future of privacy? We're going to be as applied as possible, as practical as possible, and we're going to mix it up a little bit if you've been to Churchill events before. We're going to go and ask some questions as we go and keep this as, uh, moving as, uh, with some energy and some jazz, okay? This is where you would go. Mm, okay. God, front. All right, okay. All right. Trust, the biggest issue of our day. So who is responsible for our private data, for our own personal data? So let's just walk around the, walk around the panel a little bit and, and start. What, what do you think? Like, who is responsible for our data? Uh, we're responsible for our data. So first of all, anyone who thinks privacy is dead, I will argue, if you will let me later on, that it's not. Um, and if you're divesting, if you're throwing up your hands and privacy's dead, I'm not doing anything, shame on you. Um, but also the people who want to use it. I'm responsible as a data steward for the data that I use. Right, okay, what do you think? So I think we're at the point where for individuals, the idea of being able to manage your data is kind of flown the coop. Um, it's really challenging. Uh, so while we are responsible, I think we need to look at it 
more broadly than as an individual issue and start looking at it more as a societal issue and its effects on society. Okay, individuals, society, what about companies? Chris, what do you think? Well, so it's definitely individuals, societies, and companies. I mean, we've had a massive change in the background facts of the way that people think about the world. And so when you actually hold a supercomputer in your pocket that is a surveillance device inherently for what you would choose to take a picture of, a video of, a recording of, et cetera, you know, you, you, you know that everybody around you has them, you know that you may be captured in them, especially in public spaces, but also potentially in what are normally private spaces. So there's, there's a sense of, of individual responsibility that has to be discussed here. But we also have to talk about both the corporate and societal side of this, where you know, we're engaged in a massive change about the way that people assume how something that they do will be recorded over time mm. and, and what its availability will be and how that plays in. There are people who've always abused that in a, in a trust environment, lying about the, the, the things that, that they had said or did. Or, and now if you've got a recording of that, that, that could actually enhance trust over time as a process. But you also have a situation where if you're supposed to be having an off-the-record conversation to you know, set something up as a, as, a, as a plan for the way that things are going to you know, be, be set up in, in, a, you know, in a political conversation, in a corporate conversation, et cetera, the presumption that used to apply there that, that you know, the, this other person or somebody else couldn't, couldn't discover that, that's changing. And everyone needs to sort of address that and say that, that, that you know, the massive transparency era is here as well. And there are good things about that and there are bad things about that. And we need to talk a lot more openly about, about that and the architecture that we want to build. Okay, but let's, let's d drill into this a little bit. So, so what I'm hearing is privacy is everybody's responsibility, right? But what I'm also hearing is that we're renegotiating what it means to be private. And this is nothing new. Humans have done this throughout the history of human society, but now we have machines that are amplifying, like you said, every conversation that might have been private, every picture that might have been private, every bit of uh, geographic data that might have been private in the past. Now, it doesn't always have to be private. We're renegotiating what privacy and trust actually means. So how do we do that? So Ruby, from your perspective, what does that renegotiation mean? Do we yeah. need to discard our old concept of privacy or should we try to protect it and recode our machines to reflect maybe antiquated or maybe not antiquated ideas of what privacy should be? Well, you already said it. First of all, I don't know that we ever all agreed on what privacy is. It's not an on-off switch, it's not black and white. It's extremely personal, it's extremely um, cultural, it's based on my experiences, my habits, my preferences. So I may want to post a picture on my Facebook page, which by the way, I go in and I check my privacy settings all the time. I don't like it when someone tags me in their own mm -hmm. photo. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't consider that a paradox. I consider that a contextual decision that may seem inconsistent to somebody else, but it's not inconsistent to me. So I think the first order of business is understanding that trying to solve this in some easy way that everyone is going to be happy with everything we do isn't gonna happen. Um, so going back to your point about transparency, um, I think the real problem with trust is that people don't understand what's going on and why should they, right? I mean, it's like a real estate document. You're never gonna read every privacy. <laughs> I mean, I, all you care about is the outcome, right? I want the inputs and the outputs. I want a house that I like and I want an interest rate I like. And all that sausage making, I don't wanna know what it is and it's too difficult and I'm too bored. So I don't expect people to understand it all. I think expecting complete transparency in the sausage making is asking too much. But asking what goes into the process and making sure it's fair on the back end is certainly something we can all do. Okay, so that sounds to me like, I, I heard a couple things, so correct me if I'm wrong. So it, there is a, there's an individual agency that we all have to exert. Uh, and it's our, we can opt out of that or we can not, we can participate. But it also sounds like uh, there is a responsibility of the companies uh, that, that broker our content to do more, to do a better job. Jen, what do you think about that? Is it the responsibility of those companies to help broker in uh, a better understanding uh, and maybe even make it more invisible, transparent, elegant for us to use? Yeah, so uh, you know, trust is part of the social compact and so you know, I think if anybody has read uh, Shoshana Zuboff's new book on surveillance capitalism, which is probably the hot, 
the hot book in the privacy community right now. I think she lays that out very well, assuming you can get through all 700 pages. Um, <laughs> but it's good. Uh, where you know, she really highlights the fact that, from a, her perspective as a business school professor, that companies have really kind of broken the social compact, and that you can't pretend that we exist in a world where companies don't have some level of social responsibility to, to us as individuals. So um, yeah, I mean, I think at this point, it's really important that um, we really think through, to the extent, how are we communicating issues of privacy to people? Um, you know, is transparency the right way to do it? Is it, re I mean, one of my areas that I focus a lot on is trying to rethink notice and consent. Like, how do we get around those giant privacy policies and rethink what is an actual way that we could give people enough knowledge about uh, whatever decision they're making at the time that gives them enough to really you know, make a sub substantive decision, but without kind of overblowing and, and giving them this full legal document. Um, I mean, I think we're at the point, especially as we start looking at new technologies, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it's AI, you know, voice interfaces, where we're going to be interacting with new technologies in ways that we haven't before, that we really need, it's, it's time to really rethink how we communicate these issues to people um, in a way that is actually user-centric. Mm -hmm. I would say what, you know, the biggest flaw with notice and consent today, it is absolutely in no way user-centric. You know, it is, these are documents written by lawyers, for lawyers, I apologize to the lawyers here in the room and here on the stage with me. Um, no, no, no offense, but I think you guys agree with me. Um, Do you mean that? <laughs> I'm sure anybody who's written a privacy policy is like, I don't ever want to do that again either. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's time to really think about how we do this. And I think one of the other bigger issues attached to this too is that um, you know, very much the way this whole framework works is it's take it or leave it. You have no substantive choice. You know, your choice is take it or don't use the service. And in many cases today, we are moving towards a world where you don't have the option to not use the service. It's becoming pretty mandatory. I mean, I think if you surveyed this room, you'd find a lot of people in here who maybe aren't the biggest fans of Facebook, for example, but they may have to use it, especially I know there's a number of students here tonight, and I know at, at Stanford there are students who their social groups uh, or school groups uh, you know, mandate them essentially to have to be on, the, on Facebook in order to get the information they need. So you know, this world where you know, we can just walk away and say, never mind, I won't use X service, I, that's getting narrower and narrower. I think there's fewer things that we can truly just say, I can't live without that. So there's no opting out. But you, you, you brought up an interesting point around uh, uh, the surveillance capitalism notion. So right now, much of the digital economy runs, you could almost even call it the advertising economy. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other commercial models. And so Chris, what do you think about uh, the advertising economy versus um, the subscription economy for technology services versus a hybrid or maybe even something else? How, how will we keep our economy running where we have new covenants related to security, privacy, and trust. I mean, I think you're going to, first of all, I, I always like to start from the, the idea that the, that the defaults are being flipped by the rise of the internet, the rise of a supercomputer in everybody's hand that talks to supercomputers in the cloud. Um, you know, the default is now surveillance rather than, you know, non-surveillance, or right. recorded rather than non-recorded world. And, and, you know, companies have to, smartly negotiate that. Now, from an advertising economy perspective, you get a great subsidy where you're brokering attention the way that traditional media networks have. And you can use that to generate great profits, um, you know, both in the growth of the advertising market and the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, shift from TV, which still generates billions of dollars of revenue every year, to a more sophisticated, more targeted um, version of, of what you see on Google and Facebook and Amazon and a number of other uh, players in the space. And that enables those companies to spend a lot on product development and to think about you know, what, what all these things might look like to, to allow for better customer service too because you know more about the customer. So there's a, there's a consumer benefit that mm. sits there too. It's not just you know, your, your, your profile gets you know, so sold off across the web. The, the classic thing that everybody still says about Facebook is they're selling your data and the company continues to adhere, I think quite rightly, to the idea, no, actually Facebook doesn't sell the data. If they did, they would be less valuable. Uh, you have to come to Facebook to do the match. Mm -hmm. And that was how, that's how they generate a fair amount of revenue. And, and they defend, and quite properly in my perspective too, that that's to make sure that the service, the basic service is free. 
So then the question is, can you layer services on top of that and make different offerings and, and, and approach this in a different way? And I think the answer to that is just yes, too. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that you would preclude um, offering a free service is probably not necessarily of benefit to any consumer. And, and you know, that, that ultimately uh, people obviously need to be educated a lot more about what's going on. They need to have architectures that can reflect their preferences. And that was one of the things that I took as one of my key charges at Facebook was to think, how can we build a system that allows people to make choices about what they share and with whom? And I think that you've seen the company turn back to that in a pretty major way um, lately, which I think is exciting. Right, um, I, I think it's, it's an interesting point um, also that these machines have never existed before, right? There's never been any machine like the internet, like a Facebook, like a Google, or an Amazon, or a Netflix, or an Uber, those are net new, and we're still negotiating the terms of our endearment with these new machines. Um, but you had said something before, Ruby, that, uh, that was, I think, maybe part of the solution as well, which is you, we don't want to show all of the sausage making, right? That's too much for normal humans, uh, non-lawyers, to, uh, to deal with. It's too much for I'm For lawyer. anybody, right? So, it's too much. So <laughs> it, but you also said something about AI. So is AI, in, but which has also been yeah. portrayed as potentially dangerous to society, mm -hmm. but is it also part of the solution to give us more trust and privacy? Yeah, so first of all, can I just say a word about machines? These things don't invent themselves. Even AI doesn't invent itself. There are people behind the machines. So I asked somebody who shall remain names, but it was not Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> uh, who was the former head of a very large data-driven company who, was, who had just had another fine. And I said, um, given what you know now and looking back at the history, would you do anything differently about what you do with people's data and how you treat the customers? And he said, nope. Mm. We do everything we do for the customer. As if he knows, like all the, he knows what's best for you. You're all the same and I'm going to tell you what you want. Now, I feel like if the same company were owned by Oprah or Jimmy Carter, we'd all be rushing to buy this stuff off the shelf, right? Because they're trusted people. Mm. And that's why you see Tim Cook out there now latching onto that concept and saying, I think privacy is a fundamental human right. I am building my products around that concept. If you want a phone that respects your privacy, come get one from Apple, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to bring this back to the fact that humans are full of bias. It's humans behind these machines. And if we want to fix it, we have to fix humans. And I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but is that correct, right? So saying that we have to fix humans seems like kind of a hard, hard threshold yes, to pass. Yes, it is. <laughs> right? so, um, so let's assume that human nature may not evolve as quickly as our AI systems. Um, but is AI part of the solution? Jen, is AI part of creating more trust and privacy, or is it just, are we headed in the wrong direction? We need to actually unplug uh, and go back to churning our own butter. Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> I don't know how to churn butter, so hopefully we'll 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 work on that. Hopefully. I like my dishwasher and my, uh, my washer and dryer, although I don't want them to be smart. Um, Mm. So I tend to think of it as this, so I would say actually, I don't think humans are defective. We're doing what we've always done. Um, and I think you know, this is also one of the things that gets, um, kind of, I think, miscalculated mis uh, maybe when we think about privacy is if our natural state is to not disclose. Disclosing is what humans do. Mm. I mean, we all disclose to each other in many contexts all the time, whether it's the clothes we wear and our hair. And, I mean, this is all signaling that we do as human creatures. And so, you know, technology is a layer that we're building on top of human society, and it doesn't have to determine what we do. I mean, it can bend to us. Um, so I would actually say the humans don't need fixing. The tech companies need fixing to some extent. Um, and I, part of where I feel optimistic about that, honestly, is with diversity, with diversity and inclusion, because I really think that we are seeing the results of an industry that has been built by a very narrow segment of society, and that as we open up tech companies to represent a much more diverse set of people and opinions, we may really see some change in how people think about these issues. Um, but is AI the solution? Um, no. <laughs> My instant reaction is no. Um, you know, I think I am, I guess, optimistic that there's so much focus on AI right now from the point of view that the actors involved seem to really understand that it's a high-stakes venture and that they can't screw it up. Mm. Um, and what I hope comes out of that is 
a better way of thinking about transparency because I think that's one of the most crucial issues out the gate with AI is really the fact that we need to understand how these algorithms work and what the, how they arrive at the decisions they make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think right now we see that very critically in the criminal justice system and in areas where we're seeing algorithms come in and try to make decisions about sentencing, for example. And, um, and right now you're seeing that play out in the point of view of like trade secrets and you know, companies not wanting to reveal their hands to how they, they make mm -hmm. these things and yet we don't know why you know, person A is being sentenced versus person B other than you know, the biggest thing we know is that you know, it's, being, it's making predictions based on the data we have and what we know about the criminal justice system is that's inherently racist. Um, and so you have a system that is you know, capturing those, those inputs and creating outputs that basically keep perpetuating the system we have without us being able to look at that and say, why is it doing that? So um, I guess I'm optimistic that the players here really do understand that it's a high stakes question and that it's not something they can just bumble along the way I feel like we've bumbled along a lot of the internet so far. So, spe okay, speaking of high stakes investment, Chris, I mean, this is your world is, mm -hmm. is about investments. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, Jen, you also raise a great point about uh, inclusion and diversity uh, as a potential partial antidote to an erosion of trust and privacy. Uh, you're funding companies, is, is that what you're seeing? Is this, is this A, is, uh, is this part of the, of the antidote to improve? Um, how are you seeing that? There is a deeper and deeper understanding about how important getting this right is. And I think that there is a, an openness uh, among a number of different, you know, large influencers and everybody who comes up through the industry. And one of, one of the best things about, about the Valley here is, is how, you know, how they'll celebrate a 20 year old who comes up with something and, and it doesn't matter um, sort of that they don't have the, the, the pedigree, the right backing initially. And then obviously there's signaling that it happens every step of the way over time and things kind of move up, people move up the ladder. But for the most part, it's, it's exceptional people with exceptional insights. And that's how you build to, you know, massive numbers of people using your product over time. But that has to evolve too. And I think that there's an understanding among those who have have sort of gone through that process and successfully that, that the goal is not to you know, cement everything in, it's to think about what, how, how things should evolve and how you continue to, you know, to make sure that you're connecting with people over time. This is the first time that we've ever had massive interconnection among human society at distance. Um, it's always been localized. It's always been people sitting in rooms together conversing. Now you have a, you know, again, the supercomputer in your hand that connects anywhere at any time, and you're, that's gonna get even more enhanced over time. Now, you, you end up inevitably with the, you know, the Skynet worry is what I like to call it, of course. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the totalizing AI that comes in and decides to do away with the inefficient humans who, you know, who, who operate in this space, and they send back Terminators in time, and they get elected governor of California and all of these different <laughs> things, right? So um, <laughs> it's, it's a real worry. You have to worry about the ethics of these things and, and, and to think about them. Um, you know, but the, the, the idea that, that all of these things inherently sort of run towards the bad Mm -hmm. is, is just, you know, it, it's all in our control at the end of the day, that there are choices that we can make and the transparent debate about that is a very healthy part of figuring out how to do this right. Well, I will be afraid of Terminators when the electric door on my minivan works consistently. I think that, that <laughs> we're just not there yet. Um, minivan. Any van, right? So uh, <laughs> I got two kids and I drive them around. So uh, <laughs> look at you go. Huh? <laughs> so, so, what just happened? Uh, so, are there any questions? So this is good, I could keep going, but I'm sure that there are some burning questions in, in the audience. Yes, ma'am, you in the back there would be great. Oh. We should have a robot do that. Um, hey, I'm Lisa. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for um, sharing your thoughts with us tonight. I think one of the things that I'd love to understand is for folks who have made decisions about user privacy, how do you go through that process? So uh, maybe to make it a sort of real example, like if you are looking to collect a particular piece of data that you don't already collect, how do you mm -hmm. think about that? Um, and how has that changed in the last few years? Oh, well, yeah, so, um, so I can tell you what, what I've done. Um, first of all, I'm always looking for a principal basis for the collection, which is going to be how is it going to impact the user experience. 
And I find that now with all the differences in laws and the lack of harmonization that to at least be a relatively consistent basis. If you take your Uber from California, you drink too much, you decide to go all the way to Vegas, I don't want what happens in Vegas not to stay in Vegas. You should have the same experience over state lines. So I'm not trying to specialize my products for any particular nuance of the law. I mean, I want to be compliant, but I want to do more. I want that to be the low bar. So my first question is how, to, how is this going to impact the user experience? And a specific example is we thought it would be a great idea to give users the option to have their contacts and calendar imported into the app. Guess what? People know Likey. So we took it back out. That's how you do it. By the way, people tell us all the time what they like and don't like about the app. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> Go check your Twitter feed. So it's not hard for us to figure out. So that's very interesting. So it's a, it's a test, react, test, react, test, pivot, test, pivot. Sometimes, because we think we know, right? I mean, yeah. we do focus groups. We have data scientists, right? We're trying to make it nicer for you and easier for you and more convenient for you. But that doesn't mean that the majority of the people are actually going to like the way that's instantiated. And so if it's not essential to the service, I mean, there are certain elements. We can't pick you up if you don't tell us where you are. But if there are other elements that we're offering to you as a convenience and you don't mm -hmm. like it, that's the great thing about an app that's much more flexible and you can take things in and out. Chris, what about you? Are there cases where maybe you've, you've learned something or you've decided uh, that's data that we don't want that data? Well, I mean, a lot of it is about thinking, is thinking about architecture. The, the last thing that we launched before I left Facebook to run for a regulatory position, Attorney General of California, um, was the per object privacy that, that we had for we, where you could select the audience for every post that you had. And the goal was to be maximally you know, uh, empowering of individuals to make that choice on their own. And so you want to think about how, your, how your, uh, your, the various products that you build are going to be used in, a, in an average consumer environment. And you do user testing, you do feedback all the time. And there, there are these amazing, you know, feedback loops that operate through Facebook and Twitter now. One of the best things that we found um, uh, when we launched Newsfeed um, while I was there was that, that the protest groups against, it was students against Facebook Newsfeed because it was still a, uh, a college only product when I, when I joined. And um, you know, so students against Facebook Newsfeed was, was, you know, grew to a million users in, as a group because it was promoted in the Newsfeed. <laughs> I mean, it, it ended up being this amazing feedback loop. And that, that you know, you, you have to pay attention to the way that your product is used um, to, to deliver feedback, too. And then sometimes, with, as, as in the case with Newsfeed, we, you know, we sort of said, look, everybody, like, try it for a while. <laughs> and, and let's see what happens. And now, you know, feeds, feeds are the predominant way that people experience these things on their phones. Great, great. I saw some other hands. Uh, sir, yes. Um, where's the? Uh, panel, my name is Frederick. I'm, I'm with the state of Arizona, and I've been following the privacy issue very closely. Uh, the California Governor Newsom had proposed a data dividend, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, what's your reaction? Is that the type of industry collaboration? Is that the right approach to get industry to buy into this, or is that some that have told me feel that's an added California tax in a way? Mm. Um, and just like to get your reaction. Jen, why not you take it off? Yeah, um, I am a little skeptical of the pay you for your data um, movement. And it part, it's because it's very difficult to price your individual data. Um, what's valuable is data in the collective and not so much data as the individual. And so I think that, I mean, other people will have stronger opinions about the idea of giving people property rights in their data. I mean, it seems like intrinsically it makes sense. Um, one of the pieces of data I have been studying lately is, is DNA, because I'm very interested in the genetic testing market. Um, and it seems, you know, a common sense that you would own your DNA. It's yours, it's your genetic code. Um, you know, so what does it mean if you're licensing that out? You know, do you want to get compensated for it, for example? So I'm a little skeptical of that proposal. Um, Mostly, too, because I feel that as like an information management problem, the last thing most of us really want to do is to manage our data. Um, how many of you actually organize your photos? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, I mean, you know, how many of you have smartphones full of photos and there's no rhyme or reason to it? I mean, to some extent, we are using algorithms that we're trying to organize them on our behalf because we'll never do it on our own. 
Um, I feel like most of us are not interested in actively managing our data, so it becomes something you kind of delegate. That said, I think there is, it's something I think we may have to revisit in the longer term, and I'm gonna use the B word, blockchain. <laughs> um, only because I feel like this is one of the few areas that I feel like blockchain could potentially be useful in the future, which is being able to kind of track our data and basically have kind of data custodianship. So a company takes your data and essentially they have to watermark it, for lack of a better word, you know, or basically, you know, authenticate it in some way so you're able to track it as a unit from, you know, where it's been. So you have a better sense of where is your data. But the idea of necessarily being paid for it, I think we would spend a lot of energy on something that would ultimately pretty be, be fairly disappointing for most individual consumers. Uh, so I, I want to turn this on its head for a moment. So uh, there's something that we put out as a little provocation uh, called the trust paradox. So there's a lot of discussion about uh, perceived violations or, of misuse. Um, monetizing data that I didn't say you could monetize, uh, a, a hack, a some sort of privacy breach of trust occurs, and then there's an uproar. People get mad and Twitter lights up and, uh, and there's a, a momentary conflagration. But over time, we don't unplug. So what we say is not exactly what we do. Or we may unplug, but then we're gonna plug back in again. Um, so there's a paradox between what we, would, what we assert about trust and transparency and what we actually do, which would drive the actual economic imperative of providing trust. So Ruby, explain that trust paradox. Is right. privacy something we actually have to worry about or is, this, is it privacy theater? No, first of all, we do have to worry about it, but I think, alluding back to my former comments, first of all, if you're going to you know, bring out your torches and pitchforks because somebody sent you a tailored ad, and then you're going to give all your data away for a $2 coupon to the Waffle House, that's on you, and that's the paradox <laughs> you're talking about, and it happens all the time. Um, I don't mind that Zappo Shoes follows me around eventually. I will buy the shoes, it's a good tactic, and I get a free service And you know it. why they're doing it. Right, I know why they're doing it. But I'm gonna admit something that's kind of embarrassing right now to pr kind of prove your point on the other way. So. I said privacy super contextual and based on experience and your habits and everything else. So I'm gonna go back to your genetic testing thing for a moment. As a privacy advocate, I really care a lot about everyone's privacy, not just my own. And so I go out with my sandwich board all the time and talk about this. Here's an area where I don't care because based on my experience. Mm -hmm. And so I don't view this as a paradox. I view it as a contextual situation that makes me have a bias that I've recognized and it's on genetic testing. I grew up in Sacramento, my home is in the center of a bunch of rapes from what we called the East Area Rapist, who's now known as the Golden State Killer. My dad bought a gun and slept with it under the pillow. I was afraid to go in his room at night. I knew if anyone broke into our house, someone was gonna be dead. So if you ask me how I feel about this man being caught by genetic testing, I'm like, F him, good, mm. you know? But yet I'm a privacy advocate. Does that mean I'm full of contradictions and paradoxes? I don't feel that way on the inside. I feel like I've made a judgment call based on my experience and a weighing of the benefits versus the detriments, and for me, that's where I come out on it. But for someone not knowing my history, that's gonna look like a contradiction. So we don't know what, where people's attitudes come from, so I am reluctant to judge. Hmm. Chris, what about you? you? I mean, you're helping shape businesses, you've been involved in uh, you know, one of the biggest ones, so what's your thought on this? I mean, I think the question is how do you build technology that allows people to make their own choices. I mean, that, that's the key to this, is, is it, and finding that balance to not make it so complex so that the technology gets legalistic too. Um, you know, you don't wanna be interrupting people every two seconds to ask them, you know, do you really consent? Really, really, really? Mm -hmm. And you've seen the GDPR move, which I think is generally speaking a, a good thing. And, and I think a lot of, you know, sort of making this more transparent, having a more uniform approach to it, it's driven good things here in America, you know, not just in Europe. And I, I've always had more comfort with um, the European approach than I think a lot of my American colleagues have had. But um, you know, you, you can't make this a bad experience for people. That's a disaster too, because what they'll do is they'll they'll just you know they'll put stuff up. Well, you know, they'll sell the data for two dollars at the Waffle House. It's this it's this easy like how does a contextual choice get made? The the 
you need to think about like what sort of world do we want to build mm -hmm. um, where people have choice about what they share, mm -hmm. and then how do you reflect that effectively in code and experience? And you know, I, I do think that one of the reasons that Facebook has succeeded is that they're actually very good at that. And so this is the interesting thing where you know a, a lot of people are like, Facebook's the biggest invader of privacy. Facebook is the tip of the spear on a massive change in the world. Um, and one of the reasons that they've risen to the fore is that they got the identity layer right um, and, and sort of it, adhering what you do online to your individual identity in a way that no one had done effectively before. And they haven't done it perfectly and they, they, I think they would definitely admit that. Um, and there are fake accounts and things like that, but they were one of the first services to rightfully be aggressive against fake accounts and to say, no, we're actually gonna tie this to your individual identity so that you have to take responsibility for your comments and your actions. And now they've you know, gotten more and more, they're trying, to, they're trying to do a very difficult, you know, uh, hard set of choices right now where they don't turn into a massive sensor that has its own aggressive political point of view but that it also is, is very much in favor of creating a discourse community that allows people to communicate well. Uh, you, the, a couple of great points on that. Um, you brought up GDPR. Uh, one thing, and I think it, it bears kind of keeping in mind, is this is really hard, mm. right? Yeah, we ha yes, we haven't invented these, and it's really hard. So, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, some of the big platform companies take a lot of heat, um, but they're arguably, the first, and, and I think they're doing, by and large, a good job of trying to react. Um, but the issue of regulation and policy, I think, Jen, I'd be interested in what you have to say about the role of regulation, right? GDPR is one of them, mm -hmm. but more and more regulation, uh, industry regulation as well as legislation within d different uh, governing entities is coming up and saying, look, uh, we don't like how this is going, we're going to impose rule. So what are your thoughts on regulation helping or hurting the move to better privacy and trust management? So I think, so one thing I would want to clarify is what we mean by trust. And so I think we talk about trust a lot in the space as if people are individually trusting these companies like they trust people. And I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, at least my own research would argue that that's not how people think of it at all. It's not like I have a personal relationship with Mark Zuckerberg and when I think and he might be the exception because he's so well known but you know Tom Tom from MySpace <laughs> Tom from your first friend yes exactly <laughs> um, you know but for the most part nobody I, knows what MySpace is <laughs> <laughs> I taught Sorry. a class not long ago and I said eBay and half the audience or half the students were like what's eBay <laughs> Ooh, I know <laughs> that's college today um, we're getting old, people. So um, I have a minivan, so and now I want to go to Waffle House in my minivan and, <laughs> and give up your privacy as well for two dollars or two bucks. Yeah, right, why not? So. It's a good waffle. I am sorry. No worries. So, um, so trust. So trust is one of those things that is not so much about our personal feelings about the company. Um, trust is more what I'd call structural, hmm. meaning what are the things that kind of enable trust? And some of that's trust in institutions. You know, we're, we talk a lot about there being an institutional trust crisis in America right now because we have less faith in government, less faith in it to be effective. Um, I think all those things kind of feed into, um, you know, kind of bigger issues of trust that even affect this space. And so um, given that when we talk about trust, I mean, part of it is maybe your individual relationship with a company and how that company treats you, but it's also related to all these structural issues. And so from that point of view, what I find in my own research is that uh, people are looking to um, the law when it exists, and oftentimes they don't understand that the law actually does, they're in, in the US at least, that we have very few laws that actually protect you and the information you divulge online. Um, they are looking to kind of structural ways that they think they can, um, that they think companies will react. So one of, one of the things I hear often is like, well, I'll complain on Twitter if the company does something I don't like. And so that really is going to the court of public opinion and thinking that companies can be published, sorry, published, punished for their actions by, you know, basically embarrassing them. And so just, this is a way of saying that I actually think legislation is an important part of the puzzle. Mm. And it's sorely lacking, I would argue, here in the US. And especially, I think, you see that in kind of the worst corners of the market. And that's where I think of uh, online tracking, you know, the ad tech 
and I, I will just say right up, like I think a lot of what ad tech does is, is really sinister to people. I mean, people don't like it. They don't like the sense that they're being tracked and they don't understand who's doing it and why. Um, I mean, your shoe example is, that I think is the best possible example in the sense that when people get tracked by doing some behavioral tracking, at least you know right now that I looked at the shoes, now the shoes are following me, it's a feedback loop, I, I get it. I might think it's annoying, but at least I get it. Mm -hmm. um, the whole meme we've had around is Facebook listening to me, um, I think is a really good example of where that's gone over the edge, where people just don't understand, like why was I just talking to my friend and suddenly I'm getting ads about this, you know, and I can explain why, uh, if anybody cares. But it's, <laughs> but it's just to say that, um, you know, people don't like that. And so where we see the, the kind of worst, the excesses, I think, are in the data brokerage, you know, online tracking, where it's kind of a race to the bottom. You know, we talk about data being the big oil, and I think that's where we see people really aggressively pursuing it kind of at, with no boundaries. And so to some extent, I feel like legislation is necessary to rein in a lot of practices mm -hmm. that are exploitive um, and really don't respect kind of people's boundaries and where, where they want their information to go. Um, in terms of like individual legislation, um, the GDPR is a big complicated thing. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time the last couple of weeks looking at the California Consumer Protection, or sorry, California Consumer Privacy Act uh, and trying to make sense of that one. Um, Good luck. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> It's been challenging kind of thinking that one through. Um, so, you know, the big question is that I get, I just got it today in another context, you know, are we gonna see federal privacy legislation? You know, there's a lot of people interested. I've talked to uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Everybody says privacy is a bipartisan issue. I think that is true. Um, whether we'll see something at the federal level before the 2020 election, I think that's the big question. Mm. I mean, and the thing is, even though we do see people on both sides of the aisle caring about this issue and wanting to do something about it, um, you know, I think we have a very dysfunctional Congress at this point that even with the best intentions, I don't know if we'll see something All soon. Right. At least be not before the CCPA goes into effect. All right, so, but certainly, certainly necessary, a necessary player in managing whatever our definition of trust is and transparency. Um, okay, so let's go, oh, he's already got the mic. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm ready, so, so I, I ask this question as, a, I would say as a recovering advertiser who <laughs> steered hundreds of millions of dollars to the social platforms, and now as someone who's also written a book on trust. So we, we just talked about all of us human beings as having cognitive biases, and, and that's a challenge in the era. We also just, and, and I thought you guys expressed it wonderfully, talked about how government is moving in the right direction with legislation, but we all remember how Washington works, and it's, it's going to be a long journey to that point. Today itself, uh, the federal government announced that they're going to go after Facebook over certain discriminatory practices around advertising. My takeaway is that every stakeholder in this equation their issues. I don't have confidence that the platforms will necessarily rise up, rise to the occasion. I think government will be too slow. I think we human beings are imperfect by definition. So it seems like a, de a depressing state. <laughs> and my question is, am I thinking about it the right way or is there more hope? Chris, are we depressed? Should we be depressed? <laughs> should, we be, should, should we be depressed? Bring him out of his depression. Right. <laughs> no pressure. So, okay. um, I, look, there, there are always going to be challenges, and, and every platform is going to be misused in a variety of ways, and the question is, can you design against that? Well, and the law has to play a role in, in thinking about how you design against misuse well. Um, I, I think that there are you know, broad principles that can be reflected in law and regulation, and I think that there are broad principles that, that the platform companies can articulate around this. Um, that will evolve over time. And you know, you've, the content standards on Facebook have gotten more and more uh, sophisticated in particular over time. And you saw that in the change, of, including the announcement that they made ahead of this charge that was brought by the Trump administration um, uh, about how they're going to, to basically be much more focused on the way that the platform promotes or blocks non-compliant ads. Mm. Um, you know, the, 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 also the announcement that they made about, you know, the, the, the promotion of white supremacy 
was going to be sort of per se hate speech. Um, and that's something that they've walked a very fine line on for quite some time. And the motivation behind it is a worry about becoming you know, a, 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 a platform with too much of a political point of view. Um, and that you know, is, is, a, is, I think, a very legitimate and important worry. Um, that, that, that platforms have to pay attention to because if, you're, if, you're, if your goal, as I was saying earlier, to, is, to, is to build a you know, discourse community for the world and to share and connect everyone, um, there's a lot of ugliness out there too. And so you have to figure out how you allow the expression of that without promoting it. And that's where a lot of the distribution discussion and controversies have started to come in. So I'd say I'm long run optimistic um, about this. I wouldn't be depressed in the long run, even though some depressing things are gonna happen because people do depressing things. I mean, the, one of the key things that I had to deal with when I got to Facebook was the you know, epidemic of, of grooming um, of especially teenage girls and boys um, on MySpace and Facebook. Mm. And, and you know, MySpace had a, a, an identity layer that wasn't really tied, it, it wasn't tied to anything. It was easy to create accounts and fake accounts and to hide your identity. And we had a different approach to that. Um, but the, the assumption was that this was just gonna grow as we grew as much as MySpace did, that it would be as bad on our platform and all the discussions with the regulators. And we were able to get over time to an understanding that no, actually, if you architect it differently, um, you actually get different outcomes. And, um, and that was actually, I think, a great learning experience for them and, and also for people at the company. <laughs> Um, because there were certainly people who wanted to say, oh, we just can't take any responsibility for that. It's like, well, you know, there, there, maybe we shouldn't have legal responsibility, and there, were good, there are good protections still for platforms, mm -hmm. and there should be, legally, um, for being held legally liable for what third parties do on your platform. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't build a platform that, uh, you know, sort of reflects humanistic values. And the, question then is, is, and the question then is how you, how you do that effectively. And we experimented with a bunch of different ways to, to do that effectively, including allowing users to vote on the terms of service, which you know, mm. nobody, nobody remembers now. They'd have to <laughs> but, read them. But we did, in fact, try Well, exactly, yeah, you know, we, we, we did try this. And, I think. And, 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 you, and I think you've seen so, a little bit of a return to that on the user content issue where there's going to be this panel of 40 or 50 experts who are sort of qualified as a Facebook Supreme Court on appeals, which I, I think is fascinating, and I think it would be great to see how they implement that. Oh, so that's, I mean, that's a very interesting response. That, uh, I mean, in, sp in spite of or because of the difficulties of wrestling with these very fundamental issues of what is trust, what is privacy, and how do uh, these platforms all over the world in every industry actually encode our social better selves? And in spite of the bumps in the road, and some of them are pretty significant, it's still a song of hope, right? And so wh what about you? I mean, you're, you know, you're at the front lines of this right, right now as well, so what do, you, what do you think? Do you have a sense of optimism? Or, or? I am probably the Pollyanna of privacy, which is hilarious, because I'm a totally cynical, sarcastic person. <laughs> but I am, and in fact, <laughs> Just to give people hope, I've been going around giving outlandish um, percentages of chance that a federal law will be passed this year, just to give people hope. Today, it's 30%. So, <laughs> so I think it's important to, to, to stay hopeful and do what you can. But I also, back to the point of principle, so privacy by design isn't just a buzzword, it's real. Mm. And if you approach things from a principle basis, you're already gonna be on much firmer footing than if your first glance at this is going to be, what can I get? How much money can I make? What can I grasp? I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I need to have it just in case. That's the wrong way, and that's bound to fail, and you're bound to make people angry. Mm. So approaching it from the first instance of a principle basis for the data, going through the privacy by design process, evaluating according to how you understand your customers and their needs is really a very, very important first step and a legal first step in many countries now, and that's just going to keep pr proliferating. So if you've been putting this off, the time is over. It's, it's here, and we have to keep doing those things. I love that answer, that, that, I, and, and, uh, and it builds on what you were saying. And So principles and ethics is a foundation, uh, and it's, 
it's maybe even a better paradox, right? We've got the most powerful digital technology machines in the history of humanity. And yet, what, the answer to our problems might be 2,300 years old, written in Aristotle. And uh, I mean, is that how you see the world as well? Yeah, it's funny. I think it's a good time to be a, um, a philosophy uh, mm. PhD if you've studied like philosophy and technology because there are many companies that want you right now to <laughs> opine on their AI systems mm. and mm. help them guide them in terms of ethics. Uh, and actually, what Chris just mentioned, too, I think kind of points to a bigger question, which is he was talking about the Facebook Supreme Court, which is a real thing, if anybody yep. has heard of it. It's very real. Um, but I think it, it points to like a missing layer we have right now in society of whether it's the technical expertise plus the kind of public orientation um, that, I mean, just, I don't know how many of you watched the Zuckerberg hearings on Capitol Hill, and you know, many people were just disgusted at the lack of technical knowledge by Congress. And yet, I actually, I don't think it's, ne I don't think that's necessarily Congress's fault in the sense that, you know, if you represent a district or a state where technology is not, you know, part of your primary part of your economy, why would you have that expertise, either you personally or on your staff? I would have a much higher standard for our California senators and representatives. Um, that said, we, you know, right now, the White House Office of Technology Policy, I think, is horribly understaffed. Mm. You know, we killed the Office of Technology Assessment back in 1992 or 94. That was Newt Gingrich is doing. Um, so we've lacked, um, you know, federal level leadership in terms of trying to, you know, give us answers about how we think about technology from a societal level. That's not partisan and that's, you know, has the public interest attached to it. So um, I know that in my academic world, we're seeing a lot of interest right now in trying to build people who have the hybrid experience. You know, I was more of a unicorn coming out of um, my education, but we're trying to build more unicorns and people who have the background in technology and public policy and computer science because we see like you we really need those people and we need those skills and we need to have people who aren't just coding machines. Mm. Um, so there's a you know there's an effort across the U.S. on many different uh, campuses, a consortium really, to try to train those people for the future. But I'd also say we we as a as a you know both at the state level in California and as a federal government really need to wake up and say we need like a public office of technology right. that really you know looks at these issues and cultivates these people and, and you know allows us to build those judgments because again I don't think it's it should be up to an individual congressional committee or an indi individual congressional staff to have that expertise I think we need to have you know that at the public sector overall I love that the education for the hybrid experience so there's another question over here I wanted to bring up, um, Jen, uh, basically we, in this room and especially in Silicon Valley, we can all say that, you know, people who know the technology, privacy becomes a personal responsibility and it's easy to maybe carry it. Even in Silicon Valley, a lot of times I go to friends' house and they immediately, because now they know, oh, help me to set my uh, Facebook uh, privacy, uh, change it and, um, ch uh, you know, make it a little bit more secure. Or there are a lot of people who are even using Uber or some other applications. They have no idea how their data is being used. So for, for this area, still we have some issues. But in general, throughout the country and even the world, there are a lot of people using applications and they have absolutely no clue on how their data is being used. Mm. And we talk about regulations and government stepping in, but overall, I think education is a very, very big deal that it's currently is being, um, you know, not, not too much highlighted on. So how do you think it becomes uh, a sort of like a every day and every person's uh, agenda to really seek some form of education that's easy to use, user-friendly, and they can figure out how they can protect their data and their uh, information. Because right now, I don't think there is an easy way for everyday man type person in the middle of even the country to do such a thing. And, and I think a lot of companies who have these applications, they have to make it easier and not so peculiar. I mean, it's not that easy to set the privacies even on Facebook. So 
uh, I'd like to hear your comments on the education and how we can expand on that uh, to make it easier. Thank you. Why don't you take a, take a I shot? I was going to let Jen, she's the educator. Okay. <laughs> sort of. Um, yeah, so I was just, uh, I'm putting together some comments on the CCPA, and that's one of the key things I am raising is the fact that we're getting ready to institute this law in California, but there's no education funding attached to it. You know, there's no public outreach attached to this law. So we'll have pass a law and nobody will know we have these new rights. Um, I agree, and I feel like public education on this issue is desperately wanting. As a parent, I feel I'm not quite at the stage yet where I've had to really grapple with it, um, but it seems extremely uneven and you know, you know, completely random according to what school your kid goes to and if the people there happen to be, or the, te the teaching staff you know, has interest, or there's a parent who, you know, like me, who can come in and talk about privacy to a class. So mm -hmm. um, that would all, I think, uh, entail a lot more effort and a lot more money, uh, which clearly is a problem with education in this country, period. So that's where I'm a little uh, depressed about that one. Uh, that said, I, I, I'm wary about putting too much, um, too much pressure on individuals to have to sort through all these things on their own, just because I feel like it's complicated. Uh, I, right now, have been trying to really get at the bottom of location privacy and location tracking on both Android phones and iPhones, and it's complicated. Uh, as someone who has a PhD, I am like beating my head against the wall, really trying to get a sense of, okay, what happens when we talk to the cell towers, and what you know, what information is happening, what, what, what's being tracked about us versus cell towers versus you know the providers. Like it's, I wouldn't, I couldn't educate, you know most people about that issue and then expect them to have to make educated decisions about it. What I, my point of view right now as I've been looking at location privacy is if I turn off location on my phone, does that mean I'm not being tracked anymore? Like that's the kind of level I'm trying to sort through right now. Like is that a meaningful choice? Like if I want to educate you to say, hey, I want to use a smartphone but I don't want you tracking me, you know, I want to have the ability to turn off location tracking for whatever reason, does actually switching that flipping that switch, do what it th I would expect it to do. And so one of the th things I'm discovering is on Android, no, it doesn't. Google is still tracking you. You have to dive into about you know, many different menus and turn off at least two other settings before you get some semblance of not being tracked. And even then, I'm not sure that's actually what's happening. Um, so that's where I'm like, yes, I would love to see more education, but I would hate to put the pressure on kids, for example, to say, you have to make the right choice. Because more often than not, it doesn't matter if you want to make the right choice. The technology is probably not going to let you make the right choice. Mm -hmm. So that's from an educator perspective. But what about what, what do you two think about that? So in terms of, it sounds to me like one of the big hurdles that we should collectively commit to is that uh, not only I, do we not want to expose the sausage making, but we don't want to make it a requirement that you participate in making the sausage if you mm -hmm. just want to be, mm -hmm. you know, private, whatever that means to you, right? I mean, is mm -hmm. that so? That goes back to uh, the burden, more of a burden, on the company, the technology companies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we solved <laughs> that. <laughs> Done. I mean, a, a, a lot of it is about how do you facilitate choice and 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 make it easier. And and some, you know, you can you can do broad swaths of sort of high, medium, low. Um, you always have to deal with the corner cases, though, in some ways, mm -hmm. because I mean, fear drives a lot of corner cases. I the the. the joke that I always used to tell, like to tell in, in spaces like this is, I just want to tell you all in advance, none of you can tell anyone I was here. That's my privacy setting for this setting, right? Mm -hmm. you know, for this, for the, like, you know, I, it, I, people make ridiculous demands sometimes, mm. too. And, and so you have to think about, like, the, the, the trade-off and the way that, 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 that things operate. I was recently called a privacy zealot, so I understand. Well, <laughs> zealot. But the, but the best <laughs> way is, is in context, right? So again, an app has a leg up because if you've turned your geolocation services off, it pops up and says, hey, we'll be able to find you easier if you want to turn them on, but it's up to you. Right. I know exactly why I'm being asked. Right. I know what to do. Right. It's easy. Exactly. That's the best way, but there are a lot of choices to be made, and so you know, that can be overwhelming too. Got it. And there was a, yes, someone has the microphone over here. This is, this is a great discussion, and um, Jan actually hit on uh, one of the things I was thinking about, which is children. I have three children that are from college all the way to middle school, and just within that generation, 
it's just been phenomenal in terms of the different experiences that they had in elementary school, middle school, and high school in terms of technology. So some thoughts about um, this idea of privacy. Going back to what we were talking about legislation, the idea of exploitation. You know, data is worthless until you exploit it. So I know without overcomplicating and understanding the technology, I don't want my data to be exploited. And there's a whole other level of concern as a parent. I really don't want my kids to be exploited. So to, to you know, what does that mean? I don't want people to know where they are. I don't want people listening to them. I don't want people tracking them. I don't want bad actors following them on social media. So there's basic things without even understanding, you know, what the technology or what the privacy setting is. I know that I want to keep my kids safe. So I just wanted to kind of pose that since we started around that and we've been sort of focusing on um, you know, mostly our, um, you know, ourselves as adults. Mm. But do you think that there's going to be a, a faster move to really kind of harness in this exploitation of data because children now are being exposed at younger? I mean, it's it's happening in elementary school now. They've got they're on the social media and they've got smartphones. Right. Good question. Um, so. You want to go? I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. jump in. You know, look, I, I have an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old, and watch watching their experience as they play on their iPads, and you know, we, we, there's the, the screen time worry and all those discussions. But then there's also the how do you interact, and they we have let them interact with friends online in a very in a very sort of controlled environment on Minecraft, especially is, mm. is is where a lot of this happens. But yeah, you you do have worries about that, and the question is how how is the data being used? I mean, we're very active in in sort of discussions with them and timing of their usage and and, and all of that, but but also you know knowing a bit about the way that those interactions happen, um, et cetera, and, and and setting those rules. Um, you know, COPPA here in the United States, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, sort of has scared most companies off of deep data collection for under 13s and, and the, almost the impossibility of doing you know, verifiable parental consent, the, the, the signaling from the FTC has always been that they're going to be unreasonable about, <laughs> about establishing that in any given way. And, and that actually has been a fairly protective, um, you know, uh, protective device for kids, um, a law for the kids in the, in the United States. Um, you know, we'll see the way how that evolves around the world. But um, I, it, the, the interesting paradox of, you know, you, you talked about, you know, not tracking, you know, and, and not having, you know, people who might be uh, predators being able to get access to them. Well, the question is, how do you know who the predators are? And we had a big discussion um, about this with law enforcement over sex offender registry lists and, and, and handling all, all of that. And, and the complication of that has always been that the, that the registry data is bad. Um, and so you, you ended up in this, where how do you do some more collection in these de debates? And I, I ended up getting involved in, in legislation here in California that in, in a number of states that, that expanded some collection on that front, but there were legal fights around that too. So it's, it, it ends up being an extraordinarily complicated factor. Sometimes you want more data and sometimes you want less data. Sometimes you want tracking you know, uh, available for a parent, say, um, but you don't want tracking available for somebody who would do your kid's harm, of course. Um, so how do you architect systems that allow for the good uses of this technology and, and restrict the bad ones, or may, at least make them highly, highly unlikely? And that all gets into wild data design and product design questions that, that is often really, really hard. Mm. Or there's an off switch. Sorry, I mean, it, it could yeah. be binary. Oh, I'm sorry, he had the mic. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we have time for a couple more, so why don't you, and then we'll take the mic. Yes, very pragmatic question. Tell us how you personally, individually, are using technology. Where are your limits on data collection? For example, do you have smart speakers in your home? Are you guys wearing wearables? What apps are you using? Let, let's get real, because that's really going to tell us your level of trust. Oh, can I start? I'm going to start. I'm probably the Luddite on this stage right now. Uh, I only got like a flat screen TV a few years ago. I have no personal assistant in the house. I don't have, I have a dumb watch on right now. I have really old cars um, that don't connect to anything. I use my phone to navigate. Um, I, li I like a moat. 
<laughs> around my person. On the other hand, call it a paradox if you want, I'm also very active on social media, which is kind of required by my job, and I'm okay with it. Um, but I'm also not one to go spreading around a lot of super personal information. You won't see me at the doctor. Um, you won't see me talking about the loss of a loved one on Twitter. Um, so, you know, I've made my choices and I have a balance that I think is right for me um, because I, I don't want all of my information out there all the time and I don't get a big high from, from that feeling. I don't have any smart speakers or appliances. Um, I've been testing some, but they're in my office and they're all unplugged right now. My smart assistants. Unless they plug themselves back. Unless yeah. they're battery powered. No, they're <laughs> not, luckily. Um, to me, like, the bar that I, uh, I need to aspire to one day is I don't have encrypted email, which to me is like the, the ultimate of, like, that really shows your commitment to privacy and security, and I don't have encrypted email, because encrypted email is, can be really, it's really challenging. Hard. Um, I use apps very judiciously. I have kind of the ultimate privacy settings turned on. I'm very conservative about how I use social media. I do not post pictures of my kids almost ever. Um, yeah, I'm, I tend to be pretty wary. I don't have a lot of apps on my phone. I have had location turned off, although I've been experimenting to see what happens when you leave it on. Um, but for the most part, I've been diving into the iPhone settings and switching yeah. it off constantly. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty parsimonious. I, my Facebook profile picture recently, I put a shark hat on my head and sunglasses, because, but. Oh, that's just awesome. That's nothing right. yeah, that, 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 um, That's about being cool. But it, as somebody who has a little bit of a public persona, it's, I figured, you know, well, my picture's out there, so the, you know, yeah. the biometric iris scanning world has already got me for that, you know, Can facial recognition. One, one thing, though, which he didn't ask, which is, um, I have a different password for every single account. Oh, yeah. uh, I do. Uh, I use two-factor authentication on any account that I think is sensitive. I mean, those are things that you can easily do, um, and I would recommend everybody do, just to keep the, the data you do decide to put out there as secure as you can. So. Uh, I, I use smart speakers at home. Um, I, I think that it's a, you know, it's a useful sort of expansion of computing power and access to devices that um, you know, I, I, I do pay attention to the settings and I do pay attention to where they are in the house. Um, so they're only in the kitchen and, and things like that. But, um, but I think it, it, it was important to me to sort of experimenting with mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, uh, very sort of data driven on, I've got my you know, smart Apple Watch, only the second, only the version two, I haven't upgraded to the four yet. And so I don't have full EKG or anything like that yet. Um, and uh, I'm pretty, pretty, you know, use a number of different apps m mobily. I'll set some settings to, to turn off, um, you know, location at times. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, for the most part, pretty, uh, pretty, I, you know, operate pretty, pretty openly, and, and, you know, mostly use platforms that I trust. I mean, two-factor two authentication is a critical part of of making sure that that, that security is maintained, and and that you know is, has stood me in good stead so far. So it strikes me that everyone, the, the key takeaway from across the three panelists is that it, there's an active management, right? There's nothing passive about it. It's a, it's a, it's a real expression of agency and they've thought about it. Um, but there's also, I think, a recognition from the dialogue that we have. There's a recognition that the software has to be better. It has to be more human-centric. It has to be user-friendly. User um, and there needs to be a legislative construct around which um, or, all of the, these interactions to make sure that uh, there are more stable guide rails uh, set up, I think. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. I think about it. Yes. Yes. So I had a really quick uh, two-part question. One is in the, quick mobili part. Sorry. In, in the mobility <laughs> section, um, sector or system, people are trying to visualize trust. Your car is going to care about you, et cetera. Um, I would love to know if there are good examples of visualized trust, um, and I mean art, aesthetic, uh, mobility issues, but not cars necessarily. And is there something like the global um, uh, goals, plat sustainability platform that the UN has adopted that secretly you guys are all trying to create for us that we don't know about, but people are working on? I mean, is there a thing somewhere where people are creating You've exposed this the cabal. Magna Carta <laughs> of, um, of trust? The Privacy and Trust Illuminati yeah. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
The first rule is don't <laughs> talk about the Illuminati. Don't talk about the Illuminati. <laughs> so is there, no, so okay, so to be serious, sorry, uh, so seriously, so what, so what are you thinking, well, if I could rephrase the question just a little bit. So there's a, I heard a sense of, you know, can we artistically um, embrace a future? Can we um, think about what's going to come down the pipe, right, in the future, right? So let's look out a little bit uh, from a technology perspective and things, uh, don't divulge anything you, you don't want to, shouldn't, but just more generally, not as about a specific platform, but when you think about the future of trust and privacy, What's your vision? Is it a song of hope? Is it a song of despair? Um, think about, you know, we're going to get through an election cycle in 2020. Uh, what about 2024? What's the dialogue about trust and privacy going to be in 2024? Yeah, I, I can't say any more than I can. I'm not a technical person. I can't say any more than I can say what the next technology is going to bring, which in my lifetime I could never have imagined as a child. But I am a very hopeful person. People have worked through much more difficult problems than this one. Mm. And what we need is people to care about it enough to do something differently. And I do think there are enough of us, there are enough Illuminati around. I know a lot of them who do care enough, who will lobby, who will march, who will do what we can at our own companies to change the narrative, change the way we think about data. So we just need more people like that to get people to care and change and shake it up in terms of when they're looking at these future technology, uh, technologies because you really can't, like, you can't say how it's gonna interact with people in advance. You don't even know. Right. What you have to do is say, I'm going to care how it does that. I'm gonna care about people and I'm gonna put the customer first. I'm gonna care, I'm gonna care. That's great. Okay, well, Jen, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, back to the, the social contract, I think, to some mm. extent. Um, so I think the thing, one of the things that gives me uh, hope is that Part of what I do is I talk to people. Um, I do user research as um, part of my kind of research agenda. Um, and people care. People care about privacy. They really do. I mean, there are always, yes, a handful of people who just don't care. But by and large, people do really care. Um, and what I see them doing, I guess, to subvert the whole idea of the privacy paradox is I see a lot of people engaging with these technologies. but whether rightly or wrongly, sometimes they're based on a very incorrect understanding of the technology, and sometimes it's spot on, but people really do take pains to not overexpose themselves. Mm. Um, a lot of people engage in different strategies, whether it's I only use Google if I'm not logged in and in a private browsing window, or you know whatever it might be. That's just like one example. Um, or I put in a bunch of fake search terms occasionally just to confuse the search engine. You know, which you know may or may not work depending on you know how frequently you do it. Um, then you're gonna get swatted because yeah. you're gonna <laughs> right, right. put the wrong thing in there. <laughs> um, but so I guess what makes me optimistic is people do care, and I think like Ruby said, uh, I think that there is a growing frustration with the state of where things are and a growing feeling of pushback that we're, you know, I'm angry and I'm not gonna take it anymore. I'm mad as hell. Yeah, mad as yeah. hell, I misquoted it. And I'm not gonna take That's it anymore. That's because I'm older than you. Yeah, I, it's, only, <laughs> well, it's on Broadway that again. Right. Network's is on it? Broadway again, so. Uh, in terms of like, is there, are there people building kind of trust platforms? Um, there's lots of different stuff, I think, going on in this space right now. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, the mm -hmm. father of the internet, is working on a project uh, that I admittedly don't know a ton about, but that's focused on, I think, trying to th rethink the architecture of the internet around personal data. Uh, and I would encourage you all to check that out if that's of interest. Um, there's also some more rethinking about privacy law in terms of rethinking how we, uh, making it a fiduciary duty. So there's a movement around thinking about mm -hmm. changing privacy to be a fiduciary duty, meaning that you have a duty of care, much like a financial advisor. Uh, when you ask someone for data instead of this kind of anything goes environment. Um, I'm actually somewhat optimistic about that, although I'm not a lawyer, so the lawyers may have different opinions about how effective they think that would be. So uh, those are just a couple of things off the top of my head that I think are kind of churning in this space. Oh, I love that. So there's agency, there's technology, um, you know, and Tim Berners-Lee is uh, remarkably tight-lipped about uh, uh, what he's doing. So, But uh, Chris, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I, I think that People do care, and I think that the industry has figured that out. Um, uh, that that you know, some of my former colleagues got a little bit dismissive about that, um, 
at, at, at various times. And I think that that changed pretty radically back at Facebook. And I think that it changed pretty radically in, in other areas of the web too. And I think that that's mostly a really, really good thing. Um, the, the danger that we have right now is that, that the backlash against technology companies turns into bad or ill-advised legislation that sort of gets rushed through to, to make a statement or that it gets politicized in, you know, in the sense of, of you know, just break up the big companies. And you can say whether it's you know, Elizabeth Warren on the left or mm -hmm. Trump on the right, you know, that, that I actually think this is a, a problem in general, that targeting industries just because of, of you know, perceived power is, isn't right either. You have to have a mm -hmm. consumer welfare standard. You have to be thinking about customers first. And um, you know, I think that, uh, but but the, the the companies are increasingly realizing that this is a real moment where the power is being understood, and that's why the, they've turned into to targets. So the discussion has to be had a lot more openly. I, I'm optimistic about where this ends up in the end. I mean, we do have a, you know, a, a set of discussions and systems, and I, I'm, I'm very worried about. I, I don't know if if everybody saw what happened with the European copyright legislation mm -hmm. and how it's been moving through the mm -hmm. European Parliament. It's really awful stuff, actually, in terms of the way that, um, you know, that, that it will restrict speech online and not very well thought out. Uh, there seems to be enough understanding of that that it will get, something like that will get blocked anyplace else, but, you know, but, but you, have to, you have to wonder how these processes mm -hmm. are going to work. Um, I'm long run extraordinarily optimistic. Like, this is very powerful technology, uh, empowering of individuals allowing them to speak and connect with people around the world that they couldn't reach before, that they couldn't you know, think about, even imagine. And so I think that, that the, the power of our imagination to think about how connections happen uh, is, is increasing over time. And I think that we need that desperately today. Well, I couldn't be more optimistic leaving this panel because I feel like if this kind of dialogue is what's happening, then we are in good hands. The future is bright. It is a song of hope. Um, and there are going to be bumps in the road, but I think the three of you have, have presented such a remarkably rich tapestry of what the future will look like, what the solution will look like. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing time with us. Thank you to the panel. Thank you so much, Paul, Chris, Jen, and Ruby. We really appreciate you sharing your perspectives with us so candidly, and Paul for guiding the conversation so well. As a small gift for our speakers, we have for you tonight, of course, the coveted Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you so much. There it is, folks. Right. Please wear that in very good health. All right. a, a, re a recording of this program will be available on our YouTube channel and I think possibly on the Cognizant uh, website as well. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, as for our next programs coming up for you, next week we'll be announcing a program called the Talent Imperative. And then on May 16, we have our 21st annual Top 10 Tech Trends. Wow. Very exciting program. Yes, wow. Couple other quick things. Uh, as a special gift for all of you in the room tonight, Cognizant has provided a wonderful book called What to Do When Machines Do Everything, co-authored by none other than Paul Rorig. There is a copy, <laughs> there is a copy for you outside in the foyer, so please pick one up on your way home. One other thing, um, did you know that we have a speaker coach in residence and an artist in residence at the Churchill Club. Pam Davis, raise your hand, please. She's a pioneer in AI art. And Dennis, would you raise your hand, please? I just wanted to point them out to you in case you'd like to speak with them before you go home tonight. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank Good night. You. Thank you very much. That was awesome. This was great. It was awesome. Thank so you. much.